and welcome to today's live stream. My name is Deborah and I self-publish bilingual kids picture books as well as adult epic fantasy under my pen name Delilah Wine. With me today are some of my wonderful fellow self-published fantasy blog of authors. We have Tim, we have Mary, and we also have Steve who is coming. Uh, he's just running a tad late, so we may get him to just introduce himself um, as he is able to come on. But for now, I'd like to um, ask my wonderful panelists to just introduce themselves. And if we wouldn't mind just going around in a circle um, on the screen, would you like to start us off, Tim? Yeah, sure. I'm Tim Hardy. I'm a UK-based um, fantasy author. I was the um, SPFPO 7 finalist back in uh, 2021, and I also entered at SPFPO 9, which is where I got to meet uh, these guys the first time, which was really nice. So um, I entered um, my novel, um, Hall of Bones, um, which was the, the finalist entry uh, back then, and that's the book we'll be talking about a, a bit later on on this, um, on this show. Well, uh, I'm MT Zimney, or you can call me Mary. Um, and I was also in the Spiffbo 9, proud Spiffbo 9 loser for my book, Beta. It's a YA superhero fantasy. Uh, I think it's fun. I ran a Kickstarter for the audiobook back over the holiday season, and it was successful in the final hours. And now I am self-funding the uh, sequels audiobook. That is awesome. Thank you so much for being here today with me, guys. Um, welcome to the channel. And... Oh, before we dive into all of the super, super nitty gritty of um, everything that we're going to go through today, I just wanted to quickly run through the high level agenda so everybody who's here with us watching the live stream can get a sense of where we're going to go. So we're going to start with some high level questions on the whys and the expectations that you should have going into audiobook production and a Kickstarter campaign. And then we're going to dive into each phase of the campaign and there's quite a lot of them. And then what we'll do is we'll open up for general questions before wrapping up at the end. And during this stream, we are going to be taking questions and running polls and things like that. Um, there is a lot going on on the back end. So if you do have questions, please submit them through the Slido app, which we're using today um, for today's stream. It's really easy. You can either scan the QR code or just use um, the, the, the pin that's on the screen to jump in and put your questions. And you can also vote on the poll that we've got going right now, which is to give us a sense of how familiar you are with Kickstarter as a crowdfunding platform. So uh, make sure to give the poll a shot. I can see that some people have answered already with, um, we've been a backer, but we have never actually uh, run any campaigns so far. So I'm hopeful that today's session is going to be super valuable to everybody. All right, without further ado, let's get into the questions. And I am going to start with MT here. All right. Why did you decide to self-produce an audiobook instead of partnering with a company like Podium or Tranter? Uh, I just wanted to be sure that I had total control over it, <laughs> um, which is, you know, also why I did self-publishing. Um, and I, I figured that there's so many avenues to just cutting out the middleman and hiring an audiobook producer yourself because the audiobook producer does all the work. Um, and then I, you know, I, so I used ACX and I chose um, wide distribution, which means I retain all the rights. Uh, and you do get less money per like audio. <laughs> Hi, cat. Uh, you get less money per audio, uh, audible credit used or whatever, but um, I get to do whatever I want with it, uh, which I think is pretty neat. What about you, Tim? Um, uh, very, yeah, similar kind of thinking, really. Um, I, I guess it's it is that control thing, you know, indeed for a reason, really, in many respects, is that you, you do get to make that choice. I think for me, that the, the biggest fear was, you know, producing like an audio book is quite an expensive process. It's quite a high upfront cost. So I think that the chance of that series not progressing with somebody like Podium or Tranter is obviously higher if that book does sort of like become an immediate success. So you haven't then got the option to release the, those sequels in quite the same way. So, so for me, I was very keen to sort of, uh, you know, again, run it the way I wanted and, you know, have, have those choices further down the line as well, really. That is absolutely my biggest fear with that um, because I would probably say that um, 
like the, the I've just started looking into producing my audiobook and the 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 starting number the headline number of this is how much it's going to cost when you pay for it outright it's um yeah it, 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 it's a lot of digits it's a lot of digits so what made you decide to actually go with a professional narrator instead of um doing something like an auto narrated audiobook or recording uh, and narrating your audiobook yourself yeah so I actually considered first um narrating it myself. I have a background in theater. I went as far as buying a really nice microphone. I had a whole setup in my walk-in closet. I mean, like I was soundproofing it and everything. Um, but I uh, have a 14 month old baby. <laughs> uh, and so you, you can only do so much during nap time. And it, it got to the point where I was like, this, this isn't feasible. <laughs> just because of where I am in life. And I still wanted that audiobook sooner than later. So I figured that the, the price tag is worth it for a good audiobook. And I stand by that now with my finished product. What about you, Tim? Um, I can't imagine anything worse than somebody listening to me read my own book to them for what would probably be about 16 to 18 hours. I, I think, yeah, if, if, Mary, if you've got like a background in theater and something, but that may give you an option actually as to what you know what, which way you want to go and you know life might be different later down the line but i just do not have um i don't think i, I, I can probably well i can read obviously i can, can read out loud but that's not the same as actually doing narration because narration is a performance and narration is an art and a skill in itself and you, you mentioned the ai sort of you know synthetic voice there for delight and i think for me that's uh that that's an absolute no, no, the only reason for me why I do an audiobook is because I want that emotional connection with my readers in, in a different format, basically. And you, you simply don't get a performance. What you get is a reading with, with those, um, you, know, um, you know, very sophisticated, but ultimately artificial um, devices. You get, a, you get a reading of your product. You don't get somebody who understands what they're reading, understands the scene and why, and can sort of translate that into their delivery. So, you know, for me, that kind of left me with no other options other than professional narration, because that's really, for me, what this is all about. When you do an audio book right and you get it professionally narrated, you're getting that performance, that understanding, and that, that, that has a no richer experience than if you were simply reading it yourself, really. That's an excellent point. Um, I've noticed myself that there seems to be kind of two types of audiobook listeners, and there may be more, but the two general types I'm seeing are the people who are listening to audio because for whatever reason they want to read, but they, they physically cannot be sat in front of a book and have the text go into their eyes. Yeah. Um, and then the other kind of audiobook reader are those who actually specifically seek out the narration because the narration is bringing the story to life in a way that they don't get if they're simply reading the prose. Um, now, the interesting question for me was you both have many books out in a series. In a, and in fact, I think both of your series is, are, series is, are, are actually complete. Um, so why did you decide that now was the time for the audiobook and not earlier or not later or what, why now? I mean, there's a certain level of security in knowing that the it's the completed series. Um, I'm not gonna get halfway through and totally burn out completely. Um, and while, you know, indie publishing, you're doing everything. And so in the process, when I'm mid-series, I'm already drowning in so much work. <laughs> um, and now it's like, I feel like I have my foot in the door. I am marketing a full series, which people are more receptive to than just like a single book or two books of a trilogy. Um, and so it just, I don't know, it just felt like the correct next step. And it wasn't really something that I was, that I felt like I needed. Dur during the creation of the series. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, not, I'm, I'm, I'm that close to being finished. So mine's a four book trilogy, which just shows the journey I've been on to try and uh, <laughs> get my, get the Brother of the Eagle done. But um, so your Broken Brother, the fourth book is basically in final editing now. So the book is written. And uh, yeah, a bit like you just said, Mary, it's sort of like a bit more mental space to do it, uh, apart from anything else. You know, just writing a series, you know, particularly the latter books were is quite hard because it's a very different thing to the expansive starting something new as I sort of as I've found out anyway um 
so yeah there, there's space to it and I, I just felt in, in, yeah, that the completed series the, the next logical step is you look at your markets you look at how to access new readers and the completed series is more attractive from that point of view so it, this was something i was always going to do but now i just have the i now have the time the energy and frankly the industry contacts as well and i think that you know mm. you can't just have anyone narrate your book you do need to find the right narrator and i, I was quite fortunate last year we from kickstarter project where actually the stretch goal was the audio book the actual it was, it was an anthology that was pretty a physical product then we went to stage and rj bailey um worked my mind to show it because i was what i was talking about so it was the the Anatomy of Fear, which was the um, horror fantasy anthology that came out through Kickstarter last year. And um, RJ Bailey did the recording for that. And so at that point, I suddenly thought, I've actually found my narrator for my book because I could see how his voice and his range of voices would fit mm. the type of story I was trying to tell, particularly because my story is a lot of um, speech, right? so lots of speech and interactions between lots of different characters. So again, you need a particular type of narrator that can actually modulate the voice and do those different performances to give the reader... Yeah, it was a different experience as to who they don't know who is talking. Mm. So it's quite quite important that. Um, so yeah, once I'd seen RJ's work or heard RJ's work in that previous project, I knew then I had a a solid, you know, skilled narrator I could actually then bank on to get them my project done as well. So yeah, it, I suppose just lots of different things came together, and it, it just felt like I was in a position to do it really, mm -hmm. whereas I hadn't felt that in the past. I really wonder if. Um a lot of people these days feel the need to launch with all formats. I know I've been feeling that pressure as somebody who's debuted relatively later than you guys because the, the bar for indie self-publishing has just grown so high mm -hmm. that anybody who is putting out a debut these days, if they're doing all the right things with their cover, their blurb and, you know, everything, um, it, you really can't tell if somebody is indie published or not just you know just by looking at the book and how it's marketed and so for me a lot of there's there's all this pressure and I kind of I put out book one and suddenly I'm getting a lot of readers asking me um you know I, I want to read your book but I want to read it in audio and I'm just like oh like I, I I haven't I haven't hit my ROI on, on book one so it's very very difficult for me for me to sit here and go all right, let me chuck another six or nine thousand dollars into producing an audiobook right now. <laughs> Which brings us to um, a really, really nice segue. Um, but we'll just check on the Kickstarter poll first. And so it looks like most people who are here have um, been a backer on Kickstarter before, but has never really gotten into um, doing all of the other things that are possible on the Kickstarter. So with that said, um, while we go into the next session, um, section I'm going to start running a new poll here and that is going to be whether or not um, crowdfunding uh, for anybody who is here um, is crowdfunding going to form part of your overall strategy as an author so while you guys uh, put your poll votes in um, we're going to talk about just how expensive it is to get a human narrated audiobook um, to be produced so for those who aren't familiar um, the SAG AFTRA, I hope I pronounced that correctly, um, which is the union for audiobook narrators, their minimum rates for narrators start at 250 US dollars per finished hour of audio. And finished audio means it's been edited, mastered, and it's basically upload ready. An hour of audio works out to roughly 9,300 to 10,000 words. And so your average fantasy novel of about 100,000 words is going to start at around two and a half or three thousand US dollars to produce, which I I I I I look at that and I'm like, my bank account does not like mm -hmm. that. Um, <laughs> so I'm really curious about uh, the second poll question for our panel. Um, did you start off thinking you were going to, you know, crowdfund your audiobook, or did you actually look at some other funding options besides Kickstarter to begin with? Uh well, I. You know, I make all my financial decisions in part with my husband because that's what being a responsible team looks like. Um, and we know that we have three really fat books on our hands, uh, so we knew it would be expensive. And we looked at the funds. I also quit my job this year to be a stay-at-home mom because uh, childcare is insane. But together, we decided that we at least had the money for one. Um, but I would try to crowdfund. And if it was successful, then I get two audiobooks. So, so we crowdfund the first one, and now, like I said, I'm self-funding the sequel. Um, but I, you know, other than that, like I didn't look at other options. I knew I had the money for one. I knew crowdfunding was a thing. I knew I was willing to give it a good, 
good hearty dry <laughs> and it uh imped out <laughs> in the final hours it was very stressful um i like I, I cannot understate enough like or overstate i don't know uh, how stressful it is to run a experiment that isn't immediately fun <laughs> Second, by the way, yeah. just run out fast. Norton's campaign is actually live right now. It ends in, was it four or five days? I'm confused with hours, but it's ending yeah, in we're all over the time zone, which makes it even more confusing. So UK time, uh, 10th of April at 1.28pm. Oh, well, that's very specific. Drop dead cut off point. <laughs> so how, how, how about you, Tim? Did you look at other funding options or was Kickstarter kind of your main go-to? Yeah, there's two parts, isn't there? I suppose you, there's, the, there's the choice of the platform, isn't there? And then there's also, um, hi there, Steve. Um, and then also uh, the uh, I don't know, the funding of it. And I've always taken a view, I think the whole point of indie publishing is it should be accessible and mm -hmm. everyone should be able to do it if they've got a writing talent and want to want to express themselves artistically in that way. Uh, and I think actually, you, know, you mentioned what you did, the pressure to potentially produce all formats all at once. Um, it's great if you've got an audience that wants that and is hungry for it. And actually, there's a there's a realism factor here. For me, I I, I very much start to treat this a bit as a business and say, from my point of view, I'm not going to spend more than I'm earning. So obviously, at the beginning there was an outlay to get going and get started. But then each year of the business, I only put back in what I actually make out of, of writing and producing those books. So for for me, I was never going to self pay for that audio book because then my kids would say well dad i can't go to university now and those, those kind of things would start to to come into play you know you've got other responses haven't you absolutely so I, think, I think you need to be very clear about what you're prepared to spend how much and set a limit on that and stick to it because otherwise this is you know it is a money bit if you're not careful one kickstart i mean there are options aren't there and i think you know indiegogo has been mentioned about and um i think back as well back kit rather as well as this sort of coming into the fore but i think one of the things is people are familiar with kickstarter and it is very much associated with great arts publishing there's, there's a brand recognition. So for me, it was always my go-to. I'd worked behind the scenes on the Atmosphere Kickstarter as well. So I did some of the fulfillment and some of the work with with, um, with backers and stuff as well. And that's why I was familiar with it. Uh, but I think you must understand as well, just backers being familiar with, with it also help them back. Because mm. if it's something brand new, they don't necessarily know what to do. And you know, my parents, for example, don't even know what the internet is. So you know, they can't really back these projects in a way that I think perhaps we can imagine younger people or you know, internet-enabled people can do. So it was, I think it's got the brand recognition that within the indie publishing community was really helpful but also it's, it's got that familiarity as well so it, it just felt like the right choice really in terms of the vehicle and the mechanism for it so that was my reason that's a great response thank you so much and we now have steve with us here thank you so much for joining us steve um I might just get you to catch up and introduce yourselves to uh, the live stream audience here and uh all we've covered so far is just the high levels of why kickstarter why now why were you so if you could follow up your introduction with your take on that that would be wonderful all right can you guys hear me we can okay um Dang, I'm so sorry for, for, for being late. Um, I could have sworn it was going to be 3.30 my time. I thought it was early. Uh, but, all right, they're just a, a typical American, probably. Um, so, um, I am Steve D. Wall. I am the author of The Way of Renegades, a, uh, another uh, one of the Spifbo 9 intro along with other nine people. And um, I also ran a Kickstarter for The Way of Renegades in order to get my audiobook produced. Thus, I am here. Um, I'd be here. Thank you for putting this together, Delilah. Um, what was the? I'm sorry. What was the question you wanted me to chime in on? Why did you look at doing a Kickstarter for your audiobooks, and why did you choose now specifically to get an audible done of your book? Because you and I are actually in very different positions to Mary and to Tim, because they've both got completed or nearly completed series, whereas you and I are both. Um, we entered Fifth Bow Nine with our debuts, and I was saying earlier that. As a debut these days, I felt so much pressure to be launching with, you know, with, with all the formats. So I needed the ebook, I needed the paperback, I needed the hardcover, and the only thing I could not get done on my own dime was the audiobook. So what made you, um, as a debut author these days, go, you know what, I'm actually going to launch with audio. So I did hear a little bit of the end of Tim's answer about Kickstarter and its size, its scope, and therefore its ability to reach people and that was definitely the number one reason for me why I went with Kickstarter. But the reason for using it to make an audiobook, for me, I was always going for an audiobook. I love audiobooks. I think it's this almost perfect blend to create the best media possible to tell a story um, that has these kind of uh, 
theatric elements into it and everything without having to sacrifice stuff like you see often with adaptations in film. Um, film is great. Film adaptations are wonderful, but sometimes for the sake of it being a different art form, you lose a lot of things that you get in the writing, but you still have that when you do an audiobook. And so when I was deciding to publish, it was always going to be an audiobook because I think it's fantastic. I just eat audiobooks myself. And so I, uh, yeah, the, it was, it was always on the table. I didn't go uh, hardback myself. Like you just mentioned that you got the hardback done. I was, I'll sacrifice the hardback in order to get the audiobook done. And so it was, it was always part of the plan for me. That's fascinating because um, the, the one thing I do regret, right? And for anybody who is watching this and thinking day going and thinking that you do need a hardback, I, I regret that. I, I massively regret this because this cost, um, like, and, and when you, you, cause I was publishing on a shoestring budget. Um, and so to do the, the jacket, you needed an extra cover design. So my cover design cost basically, um, doubled once you had like all the extra fiddly stuff. And that meant, um, instead of getting a lot of the nice distinguishing features that you get with jacketed, uh, high covers, I, I don't have a separate cover underneath this jacket. It's, it's just the same cover. And so in my, um, view now when I'm looking towards like, okay, what if I do want to run a Kickstarter? Doing the hideback first was a big waste because I could have launched then on Kickstarter and said, hey, I don't have a hide cover yet. Let's do a special Kickstarter hide cover, which um, based on the research I've done, it seems to be a lot easier to sell that. And we will get into, you know, doing an audiobook only Kickstarter versus, you know, audiobook as a stretch goal um, a little bit later on in, in this uh, discussion. But for now, the other question I wanted to ask up front just about funding was, did you all think or, or intend for the Kickstarter to primarily raise 100% of your audiobook production costs? Or was it just you kind of had that as a, well, it'd be really nice if, it, if that happened, but, you know, secretly I've got this other pile of savings here that whether or not the Kickstarter covers all my proceeds, I'm still going to get the audiobook. Uh, I did uh, make that my goal. Uh, I estimated my book would cost about $34. And after shipping rewards, I made my goal $5,000. And I regret it, even though I made it. <laughs> um, it was, it was like I said, stressful. Um, I found myself wishing for all 30 days of that campaign. I was like, I should have set my goal um, because this is just not attainable. And luckily, I had my real estate agent swoop in in that final day, and I guess she was feeling generous. Um, and without her, I, I would not be the goal. Um, and then I would have been out all of my things. So uh, when I tell people they do Kickstarter, unless they're very, very sure in their fan base, um, don't go for 100% <laughs> because it, it, was, it was a mistake. <laughs> about you, Steve, how was your experience of getting to funding? Because I think you have the highest goal of anybody here. You were raising 9,000 US dollars, if, that, if that's correct. Yes. Uh, yes. My, uh, my narrator was expensive, but uh, um, I, that was, uh, it was also well worth it and part of it the entire time for me. We can talk more about that later. But I was pretty confident, actually, that I was going to reach it. I agree with uh, what MT just said. Uh, like, if you're not confident, it's, it's probably not the best idea. Um, but I was pretty confident just in, uh, my friends and family and the, in the you know, fan base that I had available. And, um, so I was, I was definitely looking at getting the majority of it. And, um, and, I, and honestly, my, uh, without my mom, I probably wouldn't have made it. But, uh, you know, she, she was, she was saying things to me like, I'm watching every day. And if, you know, if it doesn't make it, then I'll just add in whatever the difference is. And I was like, no, don't do that. <laughs> um, uh. But uh, yeah, I was I was fairly confident, and uh, and it and it turned out well. You know, it was it turned out to be well founded. Excellent. How are you finding it? Because I know just trying to get over that finish line for the past week or two. Because I, I think you're you're kind of in that slump, aren't you? You're you're in the slump, but you're trying to go into that final push to the end. How's that been? Yeah, it, it's I mean, it is you know, like, the, the stress of it. I think is not to be underestimated. And I think if you're thinking about doing this. Do make sure you've got a support network of people that sort of, you know, you can cry on those at different points because that, that slump is very, very difficult to deal with. So I think my mine's doing the usual thing. First couple of days, bang, straight in, and you know, it's 25% uh, funded within hours, and that was great. But then yeah, you're you're just ticking along, watching that sort of like graph of doom so going. Up, it's not going upwards to the line. You need it to, <laughs> to try to push it up. Um, so I, I'm kind of just about to enter what I'm hoping is the final three that people talk about, where actually those final days. 
people do step forward. I think I think a lot of this is about necessity. People with 30 days, long time people to put stuff off, isn't it? And I think an awful lot of people have said they're happy to back, but they'll get around to it. Eventually, you've really got to get around to it, otherwise the project doesn't fund. And I think that often that helps produce that sort of final final cascade. So I'm about 60, 61% funded at the moment. So it's still a fair way to go. Like I said, we're actually the lowest goal of anybody here. Um, and that is, that's 100% funding the, the, the project for the reasons I wasn't, you know, I have set that as my own sort of, I suppose, funding stretch that I only spend what I've got. And I don't know that it doesn't generate that kind of income to, to like, close that gap. Even that's a compromise because it's a better royalty arrangement, you know, for, you know, our rates, which you mentioned before. There are other deals around. So you can, for example, go with a bit of royalty like combination with rate for example which is actually what the first goal really means mm. so at a higher goal effectively minor rate gets paid more but at the lower goal minor rate gets a share in what the book ultimately makes as well so i mean you know it's still, still a good deal but it's just a different type of deal so that was my compromise and yeah i did sit a little bit lower thinking you know why family would would come in and help with that but but not much because i really couldn't i couldn't i put myself back in the position mm. i was trying to avoid it. It actually funding it myself which i'm doing that i don't need all this <laughs> frankly i'll take that bank loan and do it that way Absolutely. So I think we've pretty comprehensively covered why Kickstarter. So let's get to talking about the expectations versus the reality. And all three of you have mentioned just how mentally tough it is to get through the campaign. And and I think so far we've we've really just been talking about the campaign itself. You know, once it's online and you're out there trying to rally up the potential because and, and, and get the pledges. But what I kind of want to know is like everybody is familiar through being a backer um, of what it is like when the Kickstarter is live. But if we're thinking about the overall process of, you know, going into this Kickstarter or the lead up, the research, as well as the, besides the campaign being live, also all the post campaign fulfillment stuff, what expectations did you have going in and how has it compared to the reality so far? I think I expected more people to be really excited about an audiobook uh, Kickstarter. Um, and I think part of that is like what you said earlier, Delilah, how, you know, when you're marketing a book and you have all these readers like, oh, well, is it on audio? Like, I'll read it. It's on audio. And that gets in your head. You're like, these people would support a Kickstarter uh, because I offered the audiobook as a reward for uh, like $20, uh, which is cheaper than it is on Audible. Um, of course, what I don't take into account there is people with Audible have their Audible credits. Mm -hmm. And they don't want to use the $20, they want to use their their free credit every month. Um, and so that was sort of the, uh, that was sort of the letdown. Um, and then that, like, from what I've heard from other people, audiobook Kickstarters don't do as well as like you said, like a hardback, you said you did some research on it. Um, and that, I guess, doesn't surprise me because it's like not a physical, tangible thing, which I guess mm -hmm. is like where we get into rewards, but even my rewards, I think, just like weren't like enough to entice new readers. And mm. then old readers are like, well, why would I need the audiobook? I've read your book. Mm. Um, so that was sort of the the conundrum I found myself in, but uh, it worked out. <laughs> Did you find that, Steve uh, and Tim, are you guys finding that? Um, I'll, 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 I'll think, I think, yeah, that, that's, I think not, not a physical product is a difficult sell on Kickstarter. And I suppose, you know, why are people funding you? Why are people backing you? Um, I suppose I approached it that I wanted to create something new at the Kickstarter, partly for that very reason. So I actually produced, uh, I'm going to be producing a short story ebook collection and also a, a short story ebook audio book that's a throw in that's extra, that's new. For exactly the reason you just mentioned, Mary, people have already read it. So why would they do it? Why would they want it in audio form? Some people will want it twice because they want a different experience, won't they? But I, I want to make sure there's something new in that, um, in the melting pot that would try and entice people in. But I think at the end of the day, it's just easier. And frankly, the, the costs are lower. You're trying to sort of produce something like a hardback, a special hardback edition, and things like that. They're just, uh, the, the, I think, the platform in that sector sense lends itself a bit more to it. And you, you're shooting quite a high cost, uh, and people aren't getting that physical reward. So, yeah, my my sort of ebook package you know, is very similar to yours. I think you know, mine's twenty five pounds. You know, because mm -hmm. I've got obviously pay the Kickstarter fees out of that. So you're you're paying more because you're having to cover Kickstarter's overhead as part of the commercials or that to then get through to the other side and also you know cover some other the commercial risks that can be kickstarted generally as well. So it's it's a it's a difficult one actually. Um as you know some people will be in it just for the product. That that's fine. I, I I look at it as a bit more, you know, sometimes you just want someone to succeed. You know, and I back projects. I've not I wanted the reward <laughs> to be perfectly honest. But I still wanted them to succeed because they've gone to Kickstarter and put something out there that 
you know, means a lot to them. So I often back stuff without even pledging to get the reward itself. And I think people approach it for different reasons, really. But it's definitely a, audio books are definitely a harder sell. I don't think that's, uh, you know, the message that it's seen as much as different. I, I think it's a harder thing to get across to people why they should back that. Steve? Yeah, the an expectation that I had going into it was, uh, in, in my research, I Kickstarter is the biggest crowdfunding platform there is. And I learned that there are people who just hang out on Kickstarter, mm. kind of like how people hang out on Facebook or what have you, and just scroll through different projects that are there. And, you know, oh, this looks cool off on that. Oh, that's cool off on that. Mm. And in learning about that, I was thinking, oh, that's fantastic. That's, you know, marketing that's going to happen without me having to lift a finger. And so I was thinking I was going to more random people mm. on Kickstarter that would come and get interested in and in want to get a reward or something like that. And, but the, the main thing for Kickstarter, Kickstarter is really, really big in the tech industry mm. and, uh, and in the game board industry, things that are tangible products, but they're also tangible products that are really based around visualization. We're like, mm. look at this cool gadget that I made that does this cool thing and you can have it too and you can touch it too. And so like there's this driving force that's not really present in virtual rewards. And most of my rewards were virtual. Uh, mm -hmm. I'd offer a copy of uh, the book as one of the rewards, but yeah, it, um, I was lucky to have the backing that I did, that I knew I was going to have going into it, thought I was going to get more. Um, and, uh, you know, that's that's probably a comment on me as a marketer as well, but that's uh, that was definitely how it turned out. That's fascinating. I think that's such a great insight because looking at the origins of Kickstarter as a crowdfunding platform, it was originally for these big, massive projects where the creators couldn't get the funding through any other conventional means of corporate sponsorship or grants and things like that. So that is a really insightful way of looking at it. Um, what I want to do is get into sort of the more detailed questions now. And so if we'll start by talking about how did you find your narrators? Because when I looked at all of your campaigns, you guys had already picked all your narrators. And, and I'm guessing, I'm guessing based on what Steve said, Steve, you picked the narrator and you just did everything else around your narrator. Would that be a correct statement? Absolutely. 100%. <laughs> um, yeah. So, my, uh, my narrator is Stephen Pacey, and uh, he is best widely known for his work narrating Joe Abercrombie's epic fantasy series, uh, The Blade Itself, and, or The Lost Series, I should say. The Blade itself is book one. And um, yeah, there you could just type in Stephen Pacey, audiobook narrator, into Google. And there are Reddit threads of people talking about like, oh, Stephen Pacey has ruined me for all other narrators. And so, yeah, that was a big part of my marketing strategy was just name dropping <laughs> Stephen Pacey. And so whatever it took to make it happen, I was willing to do it. How did you actually approach a narrator of Stephen Pacey's caliber, right? Like, did, did, did you just directly reach out to him? Did you have to go to an agency? Or how did you actually approach him and... What sort of things surprised you about that process of trying to go negotiate um, the arrangement with him? Well, uh, before I was I was looking through uh, like Find a Way Voices and these other platforms that are you know supposedly uh, budget friendly options for indie authors like ourselves, and I it, it got to the point where I was thinking to myself, man, if I'm going to spend this much money, I have to love voice. I have to love this person's ability to tell my story and. I, I wasn't really falling in love with anybody that I found yet. And I was like, well, you know who I do love? And I, so I I've, you know, found his agency and I just emailed them directly. I was like, hello, you know, I'm sure that you, you would never work with little old me, but like, if, you know, if you would actually, that would be really cool. And to my surprise, they're like, yeah, totally. Um, uh, I didn't actually communicate with him very much at all through the process. It wasn't until after the recording had happened that I, I was able to speak with him. Um, but it was, yeah, I, there was, I think because of his status and the, the agency that he worked with, there was very little negotiation for me to have to do, um, which in a way is a, is a good thing, definitely. Uh, and so, yeah, I just had to meet the, uh, the demands of the service, you know, and uh, it, it, it was definitely worth it. What about you, uh, uh, Mary? Because I, I think you mentioned earlier you did actually go through the ACS, uh, ACX process. How, how did you find that? It was a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> I know I know people have like different like issues with ACX and like Amazon's kind of you know big evil corporation who's stopping the little guys. But uh, 
running auditions was such a blast and uh it was honestly like the the stealing deal with like am i gonna do an audio book um i got to pick like three short scenes um that i uploaded and then over the course of like two days i got over 30 auditions and it was it they were so much fun to listen to um and I ended up going with Elizabeth Phillips, who was so talented. And she was actually the person who submitted her audition first. And she had submitted it so fast that I was like, there's no way that's good. Um, so I didn't listen to it until the end. <laughs> so she submitted it first. I listened to her last. And as soon as she started talking, I was like, oh, that's that's my main character. Um, and I showed my husband the audition and he goes okay well I guess we have to do this then. <laughs> I was like yeah because that's that's her um and I don't know how else to like, describe it like you know I was like taking notes on all these 29 other auditions and then I get to the last one and I was like it's not even a contest like mm -hmm. it, I mean it sucked because like, I liked a lot of them um and like I said earlier I have a background in theater so I know it really hurts to not get the role you want <laughs> I'm hopefully sad um, I was like, I wish you could all be Samantha, <laughs> but um, I did pick, I did pick Liz and I, she's doing a sequel right now. And what's fun with her is like, she, uh, cause Steve, you said that you didn't get to like chat with him until after the whole process really, but I get updates from her like, daily. Um, so I get like one to three chapters a day until she's done. And then I get to message her and just fangirl girl over how great she is every day. Um, <laughs> And that's kind of where I'm at currently with the sequel. That sounds amazing. Now, Tim, you mentioned that you found Jada because you had done the anatomy of fear with that particular narrator. Could you talk a little bit about how you found them for that project then? How, how did you actually negotiate arrangements there? Yeah, in some respects, it's a bit, it's a bit of a longer comp. It was a longer um, process than, than what uh, I sort of summarised there. Because actually, um, RJ's kind of obviously been in the sort of narration market for a good seven, seven and a half years now. So he's, he's done quite a lot of audiobooks he's quite well known for doing indie fiction although he does also do um, other kinds as well uh, and he'd done work for um L. L. McRae, Iron Crown and also um, H. L. Tinsley, Every Men of Ash and Shadow, both of those the FBO 7 finalist um, books so we already so um, H. L. Tinsley was kind of like the architect and the producer effectively for The Atomy of Fear so when she kind of put that pitch that project to me about coming on board and contributing a story RJ was kind of in the wings with that working relationship basis mm. that somebody would be on board the, the, the um, audio book effect goal. Uh, and to be perfectly honest, because RJ's kind of been involved in the Smith 07 crowd a little bit, he had he had approached me two years ago about doing Hall of Bones. And for all the reasons I talked about earlier, it just wasn't a runner for me, but we kept in contact. Um, and then, yeah, I suppose we, we kind of, I suppose I got to know him through doing some of the audio proofing work for, for the Anatomy of Fear. So I understand his process. Obviously, I proved my own story, but also proved quite a few of the other authors as well when we were getting through those audio pickups and things like that um so i knew we, we found we could work together it's as simple as that really so you know that it's a, a very different range to what you just described there steve of, of um you know i suppose going to the agency and they provide you with the with the performer with our joe it's a little bit more organic um so it just felt like yeah it's it's kind of become part of my promotional team on the kit on the audio book now as well so we've done quite a few podcasts um, together you know live recordings things like that um so yeah, I suppose it's just a growing working relationship where it just feels like he would be a really good fit, you know, to actually bring that audiobook version to life effectively. So it's, uh, yeah, it just felt like, um, yeah, I didn't really feel I needed to audition anybody else because I knew, mm -hmm. I, I knew he'd do it. It's a bit like you just said, Mary, where you know the person at the end, bang. I just had that moment sort of organically happening over the last couple of years, really. So yeah, it's a very different journey. That's amazing. I really love what you said there about considering the narrator part of, you know, your actual team in, in getting that story out there. And so let me segue to the next area that nobody wants to talk about um, because I just, I hate legal stuff, but legal stuff is important. And so we should probably cover this to some extent. Now, um, Steve, you mentioned that you went through an agency. And so I assume that they kind of have like a very standard process for handling uh, and where you went through ACX, which is sort of, they also have a very standard process for, for doing that. What are some of the key terms and things that you need to be aware of when, when you're going through those processes? Uh, I think just like knowing the difference between uh, the types of deal, I know Tim talked about like his lower goal is for a profit share. Um, and so knowing the difference between profit share and like full royalties, and then with ACX especially, um, if you do profit share, you have to be, um, what is the opposite of wide? Like, like ACX owns your, your stuff. 
Um, you get more money. Exclusive. Exclusive. That's, I'm an author. I know words. <laughs> I don't. I swear. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I, I want to do wide. Uh, I, my plan is to get it or to get the, all of my audiobooks into libraries, um, which like it's exclusive through ECI. Yeah, I'm going to do that. Uh, so, so just knowing, knowing that like, yes, you'll get us money uh, per sale, but like you, you own it. So you're to put wherever you want. And then I, that was also like important to me for my Kickstarter because I don't know the legalities behind like book funnel um, and offering my audiobook as a reward for Kickstarter book funnel. Like I wasn't sure if I was exclusive through ACX and I like to do that. And I was like, instead of like risking it and trying to figure out that, I'm just going to err on the side of I own it all. Mm. So I think that's like the major lingo. Definitely. Uh, yeah. Jake, you're exclusive to Audible, is that correct? Is that right? Yes. Yeah. So how, how, did, how did all of that work? Because you found a narrator through an agency, and so you were outside of the ACX system, but then you've gone in and you've actually published um, exclusive to Audible. Can you talk a little bit about how all of that works, and especially on the legal side of things? Yeah. I, so I own my uh, audio manuscript because I uh, made it and produced it outside of that. There's uh, definitely more upfront costs with doing it that way, but then the benefit is I can go um, and you know, different from how Mary just said, I am uh, exclusive to Audible and to Amazon, and but I I do own the uh, the manuscript, so if I wanted to, I can I pull it out because I didn't make it through them, and they're not really part of it. There's a distributor for me, and so I I found it to be really important that I do that if I wanted to, um, and. As as far as um, the narrator royalty and everything, I, I like I said I didn't have to do any negotiation there. But also a big part of it, why I didn't even feel the need to, was because I didn't have to worry about royalty shares or anything like that. It was just flat rate for the time spent working, and then I got a finished product, and I do what I wanted with the finished product. And I decided to go Audible exclusive for ease of mind and ease of business. Basically, I felt like it, would, it was a little bit better to just focus on one platform for, for me anyways because i like to keep things simple i don't want to like overburden myself in any way um but I, I definitely agree that like you, you need to know the differences between what you will be getting into um with royalty share or who actually owns the manuscript when, when or if it can be taken off of a platform or anything like that and so forth. um it was it was all pretty simplified for me um i, I remember even the, the contract that i got it wasn't like this big long contract it was just like a single page um and it was actually bulleted in a really simplified way um and so yeah i mean i guess that probably speaks to the the ac hobson's is just a it's a great place they, <laughs> yes, they, they business well excellent that's a really really good um process it sounds like they had in place so tim you probably differ a little bit um in how you approach your arrangement how did you manage the legal side of things? Was it something that your narrator already had a set of terms? Or, uh, because you actually mentioned royalty share. How did you go about negotiating that? Yeah, it was actually quite more informal, I think, because it was a direct working arrangement where RJ is more, I suppose, in our, in our circle, I guess is the, way, the best way to put it. So obviously there are things you need to hammer out, but the key ones being you know, you know, royalty share versus hourly rate, how those things work out, and also just agreeing how long the book is going to be. Because that, that may sound obvious, but you actually do need to sit down with a spreadsheet and work out well, if it's 70,000 words, what's your actual narrator rate? So different narrator rate at different speeds, for example. So you'll find that your old, you know, probably won't be huge differences, but that extra hour can, you know, can make a big, can make a difference to your budget. Um, I think, you know, in terms of distribution, yeah, what we're, what we're effectively creating something private. So we'll, backers will get that as part of their rewards because it hasn't gone through any of the distribution networks yet to sort of like formalise those arrangements. Um, we have, I think when we get there, that's probably the next sort of legal challenge is working out how best to distribute. And that probably will depend on whether it's a role to share um, arrangement or whether it's a, you know, a full value rate arrangement because again, that makes it effect how you go through that fetter and have to think through some sort of broker mm. to sort of do that and manage the distribution. Absolutely. I haven't actually decided whether I'm going to go with, um, you know, going exclusive actually, whether I'm going to go wide, that, that's still a to be had. But at the moment, my head is simply for, will there be an audio book? Mm. You know, will it be fun? <laughs> <So>. <laughs> No, that's very much for me a tomorrow problem. I've set myself um, October to get the main book out, so I've given myself plenty of time to sort of work through the legalities and challenges and all of that. Uh, to be honest with you, again, that's probably a bit of a partnership discussion between me and RJ, uh, which we think would be the most effective way to get the book out there into the hands of as many people as possible, really. So bit, but it's a, for me, it's a much more, you know, I don't think of it as my project. I think of it as our project, myself, RJ Bain, and also my artist, um, Dolardo, who's doing poster art, but also book cover art for me for the short story. It's very much team effort in that respect, although 
or down the one that's running at the end of the day. So yeah, a little bit more slapdash and casual, but that's the easy way sometimes. So I'm, I'm not going to apologize for that. <laughs> That's such a great segue into our next segment, which is, um, of course, about playing the actual Kickstarter. But there's so much that goes into one of these projects that I'm sitting over here and just being really intimidated by everything that I've got to think about. Um, so for you guys, when you started planning your campaigns, where did you start your research and what resources would you recommend to somebody who is thinking about doing a Kickstarter? And we might throw to MT first. Okay. Um most of my research was just like looking up strangers' characters that I could see had Cecil um, and looking at what sort of rewards they had offered uh, because you know, that stuff all stays like up. So I just typed in Kickstarter audiobook and went from there. <laughs> and then of course I had like the brain trust. My friends in my group chat, I was like, what about this? Is this, is this a good reward? And be like, yeah, do that. I'm like, okay. So that was, that was like the extent of my research was just looking at what other people were doing. Steve? I definitely think that is the, the number one option. Um, go look at other Kickstarters that were successful and go look at ones that weren't successful and see the differences and like see what people did and what kind of rewards they offered, uh, how long, like every, every little detail about what happened and what they did, like, you know, just take note of it. Um, I also, I, I, you know, did, uh, uh, what's it called? Uh, I just ran through YouTube videos as well and, you know, searched on Google and then read a bunch of different blogs on the subject. There are plenty of people who have gone through this process and are willing to share their experiences. Um, and so just go consume as much of that as you can and compare. Uh, the comparison aspect, I think, is really important because uh, one person who does an epic fantasy audiobook might have been successful and another person who is, you know, you would think is like relatively in the same uh, ballpark as them might have not been successful and they might have run very similar looking campaigns but slight differences in what how they did it, they might have made all the difference in the world. And so, mm -hmm. I, yeah, get, definitely go on a Kickstarter and look at them, but do a lot of comparison mm -hmm. as well, I would say. What about Tim? Yeah, I think what, what I think you just said is really, really good advice. I, I guess I had, you know, I did work on the Anatomy of Kickstarter in a sort of back room past. I wasn't running the project, that's eight dollars but I was very much in there in support. I was involved in reward fulfillment and help with some of the project updates and communication back and things like that. I knew how knew how it worked mm. uh, and I was also involved in the advent of winter um, Kickstarter that just uh, concluded in December which um, again was a short story anthology physical product but again seeing the sort of thing that gets people interested you know the marketing side of things I think that in them something that we understand the mechanics of how Kickstarter works we understand the mechanics of how you build your rewards so there are loads of different ways to do that and I think all of us have got very different campaigns and how we structured it lines slightly more complicated than they needs to be, but never mind. Um, and then, yeah, I suppose understanding how you get the word out is also really, really important as well. So th those things all, all combined. So I try to sort of take all that, all that into account, all that learning into account, and in trying to, in trying to build my own. Um, I think you can be as prepped as you like, and it's, you obviously need to be prepped. You know, you can't just go and think, "I'll do this and fire it for Monday." That won't happen. This <laughs> need a lot of prepared to put these in place. But you also have got to also right, accept the fact that a bit like anything in publishing, there's a little luck as well. So you know. Some books take get traction. You know, why do some books sell more than others? And it's exactly the same in, in the Kickstarter environment as well. You know, those people are on that Kickstarter space, some will look at that and go on one project and not choose another. And sometimes you really can't work out why that would be. So I think you've got to I think go in with a healthy dose of um, realistic expectations on it as well. Not every Kickstarter funds. I think that's really hard. When you've got a lot of time and energy and effort in something like this, that's a really hard stat. But actually the majority of Kickstarters do not actually fund them. So I think again, there's a. I think looking at it in the round, prepare, preserve, but also be realistic and you know, be prepared for all different outcomes. Really, I think all those things are important in preparation. I think that's so important to stress because Kickstarter actually publishes statistics, which are publicly available for every single category of Kickstarter. And when I looked at the publishing ones, it was something like sixty percent of publishing Kickstarters never make it, and also provides some deep breakdowns and a staggeringly big proportion of them never even make it past oh, I don't know 50 percent funding or something like that so mm -hmm. it just it is it is hugely challenging but since we started talking about reward tiers let's get into the details of your campaign and here's a very quick rundown of Kickstarter terminology for anybody who's unfamiliar with it rewards are what backers get in exchange for backing your project and Kickstarter allows a lot of flexibility in how you structure these as you can see from all of these wonderful campaigns on the screen Kickstarter does recommend providing a range of rewards at different price points and we call these tiers and you can also set up a menu of other things that aren't 
part of any tier uh, specifically, but you can add them on um, as part of the back of the And then stretch goals are extra perks and bonuses and rewards that get revealed or unlocked if a project um, hits certain milestones in its funding. So let's start with him because as you said, you have the most complicated structure. I was trying to wrap my head around it. Um, how did you come up with your tiers and your albums and stretch goals? And which ones have you found to be the most popular? Yeah, that's a good, good question. So, okay, there are a lot of tiers, but there's a logic behind it. It's important to stress that first of all. So it's not crazy. Um, basically, yeah, what I did, I wanted to give people range. I think, again, taking advice from other people that successfully kickstarted, one of the things that they did say to me was, you need to find tiers that will enable people to fund you. And that means probably putting creating tiers that you're really uncomfortable putting out there because really high. Um, so that I had to go, I thought five pounds must be enough, surely. They said, no, you don't understand. <laughs> you need to keep, so give people that range. If someone's a super backer, come in and like save the day and give 500 pounds. You need to give them a tier, make it really easy to do that. Effectively, my, my sort of kicks are structured up to about 25, 30 pounds. It's all um, basically electric um, rewards. So it starts with the mini short stories, then you get the mini short stories and the book, um, audio book combination, and then it moves on to the audio book all about itself. So it gives you an entry level if you just want to support it at a small number. And then it gradually builds up and then what happens is you basically stack so every tier has what has what had before plus something else and other hundred pounds start going into physical products and um, time books and all that kind of thing um so yeah i think the, the most popular one funny enough has been the audio book because that's what i'm fundraising for so that's made by far and by the most successful of tiers just people going for that's been that one and um, halfway through which is a bit more complicated i also then threw in some random tiers uh, which more to generate interest really is part of that slope. So I think you can build these things and um, you can leave them as they are. That, that's fine, absolutely fine strategy, just market and push. But I wanted to create something a little bit different. I also then put in um, some of the other kickstarts I've been before. We, we did a bit of a behind the scenes to be able to put those in as part of under package. So if you don't want the audio book, you can go the other way and get a set of e short story on Podgy e book form, for example. Um, the other thing also is I broke away from the electronic, you know, digital series and audio books and said, do you want the signed book, books bundle? And I immediately saw one of those without any of the audiobook accompaniments to it. So sometimes going with physical again, just it plays to a very different audience. Even having the digital reward, weirdly, actually put some people off backing it that wanted the physical. So there's all, I think giving people a choice, and you know, that's why there are you know, about four different days of mine, it's to people that choice and that range of options. And then say me and our Jake kind of sat there and just came up with a load of really random add ons. You can actually record your, your flash fiction if you want, for example, or the next seven books, you can do buy that add on, and it'll do that for you. It's you know, a marketing opportunity. Um, Don Larda, my artist, we agreed a limited tier where actually if you want to spend £150, show you a book cover. Um, and that's spoke original art that she'll do, you know. Um, I haven't, I have no one to pack that tier, which I'm really surprised because I think that's a really good deal for original art, I've got to say. But again, this is where the marketing side of it comes out. So fundamentally, it's about a logical stack and increased reward for increasing donation, but then also a few just on the side that maybe cater for a slightly different audience as well. And um, yeah, by far, the most successful has been £25 to um, back the audio book, which is obviously. You know, People that have done that. Thank you very much. That's fascinating. Steve, your reward structure appeals to me the most because I look at that and I'm like, this looks most doable for me. Because I, I look at Tim with the very well thought out structure and the, the array of options for backers, and I look at MT's one with a swag and you know, all international shipping. And then I just I, I like Steve's campaign. Steve looks doable and manageable. Yeah. Could you talk us through your thought process of coming up with yours? Like I said, I wanted to keep things simple and I didn't want to burden myself, I didn't want to make it difficult in any way. I just wanted to be able to fund the project and get the audiobook to people. But, you know, we just talked about go look at Kickstarters and see what they were doing. I'm definitely going to be researching Tim's. If you have 14 different tiers, um, then, like, yeah, you, you have many different rewards thought out. And I, I found it kind of difficult to think of rewards that were, were good. And I, I definitely agree that coming up with the really expensive tiers, that was difficult because it, would, it was just uncomfortable. And it was like, well, what, what is really worth that much? And, you know, it was my most expensive tier it was, it was something like one of the things you had a, a virtual coffee date with me the creator and we can talk about your book or tabletop role-playing games or anything whatever you know and and but then that's just that's work that i need to do and i got to go talk to people and, and schedule these things and um yeah it was definitely a lot i want to see more on the virtual rewards side if i could um but i, I did offer the the physical book as one of the rewards as well because it had already been published when i was doing this it was mine was a pure audiobook uh kickstarter campaign and the most, uh, what I found was the most prominent tier was uh, I had five tiers, five or six tiers, and it was the one that was like right in the middle, uh, fifty dollars. Where uh, I think probably the the thing that made it most successful was that it, you know it wasn't too much money and you got a good chunk, but it was also where I put the a signed copy of the print book. And so like I said you know, I had a lot of friends and family 
and people that already knew me and wanted to support me were my backers. And 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 I let's be real. Get your friends and family involved in your Kickstarter as much as you can. Like that's a, a huge chunk of the people that will back you. But when they are the ones doing that, you want to give them something that's meaningful. And a signed copy of your book is about as meaningful as you can make that artistic endeavor for that person. And you know, I also. Uh, especially when it was one of my, you know, close family members, I, I wrote a little note in each one. I tried to personalize it. Luckily, you know, it wasn't hundreds, hundreds of people, so I was able to personalize uh, the signed copies. Not always be able to do that, but if you have, if it's like, you know, and I'm even comfortable throwing a number out there, it might be 80, it might be like way too many for, for someone. But you know, it was, it was. I wanted to keep it simple so that I could make everything worth it for the people who did, you know, pledge to me. That makes a lot of sense. Now, Mary, let's talk about your campaign because I am really excited because you, you seem to be the only one who has done swag. And based on my research, right, which consists of lurking the uh, Kickstarter for authors Facebook group and just like do scrolling on, um, you know, Instagram and what have you, swag seems to be huge. Like it, it, it seems to be huge in, in what you see on all over social media and whenever anybody's chatting about um, campaigns that are hyped and stuff like that. But I have personally never been into swag as a reader. So I'm sitting here just going, I don't know what I do for swag. Um, so how did you come up with your ideas and would you do yeah. swag again? <laughs> I would absolutely do swag again. So here's the really great thing about swag is that I found is, uh, so for example, I have enamel pins that I had at a couple different um, tiers and those are expensive. They, you have to budget for that. Um, they ate a lot of my <laughs> funds. But uh, when you order things like enamel pins or even bookmarks, the cost per item goes down the more you order. And it got to the point where I was like, I can like over order on all of these. And I had a um, where I have the extras with me. I still have extras. And so I plan on making those available on my website and those are gonna help me fund my uh, my second and third audiobooks. Uh, and I, I personally love swag. I, I have a huge readership, but I do know that my readers are very enthusiastic. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was able to, sort of decide based on that like what what am i going to offer and like i said i had the pins and at my lowest lowest it was five dollars i had a handwritten note which i know Stephen was talking about like writing inside books but i'm like if you're giving me five dollars more you're getting a note i've done many thank you cards before i can do this <laughs> um but then i also had like a bookmark which like little tip the upcharge on having them put a ribbon on is insane just get a whole bunch and some cheap ribbon and some <laughs> friends and do it yourself uh it was like an extra fifty dollars i'm like no i could do that for thirty dollars <laughs> so thank you to my friends who let me use them for physical labor <laughs> meaning tying ribbons and kind of things. um and then i also have like a couple like animal characters in my books so one of my one of my it was, it was like my fifty dollar this was maybe like a little ambitious but it worked out I had the Pets of New Delos, uh, and that's just like the, the name of the city. And so I have them right here with me. So there's a hamster, <laughs> um, and then there's a cat, and there's a big fish. Oh, that's and so at the $50 tier, you get all three. And so at Comic-Con, I didn't have the hamster or the fish yet. I actually just got those in, so these are going to go out to... I, I finally get a delay fulfillment. Uh, but I did have the cat. And if there's one thing you should know about people who are in comic cons, they do not care what is in your book, but if they see a cat pin, they're going to want the cat pin. Um, they don't, they, and they'll be like, oh, that's my character Donka. And they're like, I, I, I want it. And I'm like, okay. Um, and then at a slightly higher tier, I had my girl, Samantha. Um, that's my main character. It's your me. Uh, and what's also nice, I have been, since publishing the first book, I have been working really hard on things better at doing art myself. Uh, so I don't have to spend a ton of money on commissioning art. So I commissioned this one. It's beautiful. Go follow Gigi Draws. But all of these like little pins, my my bookmark, like this is all my art. Um, so I was able to save money doing that. And then finally, like my favorite swag, and this one was very, very purposely chosen, is a candle. And it's called Fleming's Bookshelf. And Fleming is the history teacher in books. And a lot of my readers, and that's why a lot of my readers are like in their 30s, and everyone agrees that Fleming is very hot. And I never describe him that way, but he's an anxious single man in charge of keeping children alive. And so people have decided he's a very, very hot, eligible bachelor. Um, and I knew if I made a candle and put his name and face on it, I would get, I would upsell people. And it worked. Uh, and one person who even like messaged me after was like, it, like your Kickstarter ended yesterday and I forgot, like, can I pay tell you? And I was like, yes. <laughs> like, and she said specifically it's because of the candle. Um, and so that was kind of the the swag is kind of knowing what my readers like and you know there's not a ton of them there's enough of them who are enthusiastic enough to want these items that is amazing that 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 is a level of knowing audience that i 
do not currently have, but um, I am in the middle of reviving book two, so I'm just gonna go and put a cat and a hot guy in there and just try and see if I can move some swag that way. Um, the other thing I was really curious about, you all pick 30 days for your campaigns. Why 30 and not 16, 40, I, I, 45 sounds too long based on what you've all said about how long 30 days feels. Why 30 and not like something shorter? Well, I'll, I'll kick off with that one. Um, every day on a Kickstarter campaign is seven years of your real life. So you can't, you can't I couldn't take the stress a maximum, uh, but you also need to be give people enough chance for the word to get out. 30 days just seems okay. the accepted norm. It's what, it's what we ran for both Advent of Winter and also Anatomy of Fear. So it just felt like it gives people enough time to know about it and back it, find out about it. But also, like in my case, enough time to react to things perhaps aren't moving quite the way you want as well. So I had to introduce those tears. I had time to do that, which I wondered if I was like running a seven-day campaign or something like that. So uh, um, quite why it works that way. I don't know whether I don't know there's an actual answer to that, but maybe it just, you know, me banging on a bike and stuff for 45 is probably too I think 30 days is too long, but 45 days or whatever, definitely it's too long. So but there's also like awards fatigue that I think comes into it a bit as well. I know that when I started my Kickstarter, also Kickstarter like gave me a little indication that said, hey, just so you know, according to our numbers, you're more likely to fully fund if you do 30 days or less. Oh, and so I was like, okay. <laughs> and that is why I chose it. <laughs> what about you, Steve? Yeah, I don't, I don't know that there's, I don't have any evidence to suggest that 30 days would be worse in the long run. I definitely think that doing it for like seven days or something like that, that's, that's not enough time. Uh, because, you know, there are some people that don't even log on social media for like four or five, six days in a row, something like that. So, and, and when they do, they, they see it and like, oh, that's a great idea. I'm definitely going to back that. And then they forget about it for a week or whatever. So 30 days is a nice round number. You can fit it inside of one month and then you can kind of like just just call that month your, your, your Kickstarter month. You can make it of your your marketing strategy or what have you you know you can uh there's a lot of things that we emphasize over the course of just one single month and so 30 days fits in that so neatly that i, I think that it's probably why it's the most successful one and uh and, and yeah kickstarter recommended it to me too and i was like yeah that does sound good and it was right 30 days itself it's it's taxing on the body already so <laughs> That makes a whole lot of sense. Now, my favorite part as a former accountant, the numbers. I'm in the very, very early stages of researching costs. And again, saying this as a former accountant, it is absolutely doing my head in, trying to work out the margins on all of the items and all the tiers and everything. And um, Kickstarter, as we've already talked about, it always makes the total funds raised kind of like the big headline number, but that's really what you end up pocketing. So the assumptions I've been working off of is you take 10% off the top four, it starts 5% cut, and then another 5% for the payment processing on credit cards and things like that. Allow another 5% or so for people who uh, pull out or um, they, they, they get errors on their credit cards and the pledge just doesn't go through for a reason. Then in Australia, my marginal tax rate is 30% for, for my marginal tax rate. And then you've got to take off all those fulfillment costs of like printing and shipping and all that stuff. And once I kind of run through that and I broke it down, I'm like, there's not much left over. Like, what what have I got left over to actually fund the audiobook? So, um, Steve, if you wouldn't mind kicking us off of this one, what, how accurate are those assumptions that I've been talking about? And uh, if you're comfortable sharing, like, how, did you end up with enough to cover your audiobook? Did you have to actually tip in some extra at the end? And what would you do differently next time um, with the funding and the budgeting? So, uh, First thing is that I'll say the taxes are going to vary based on where you're located, right? So for me, being based in the U.S., I am, as an indie author, I'm basically an independent contractor. And uh, so my taxes, based off of uh, me being an author, they're going to get deducted over the course of a year based on what I made through the year. So uh, it, it seems like it, it's a little bit different with just Kickstarter specifically, maybe where you're at. So I didn't have to worry so much about uh, taxes being a, a big chunk of what I was bringing in. Um, and I, I wasn't, I wouldn't say that I profited. Uh, I, I made it to fund the, the campaign and then the, the campaign went, the audiobook went through. Uh, so in the short run, it, you know, I got just enough. And, uh, and like I said, I wouldn't have made it without my mom. She, uh, she contributed plenty. And, but over the long run, I would say that um, it was, it has been profitable, just because I, 
you know, I didn't need to do a, a profit share with anything. I, I didn't have to go through an agency that is going to take royalties or anything like that. And so the the your ten percent to Kickstarter, I would say, is is definitely pretty good, uh, or it's kind of basically on the money. And the um, oh, the thing you said, the oh, for dropped pledges and stuff like that, I never um, experienced any money coming in and then being taken back. Uh, I, probably because, like I said, you know, I didn't have a lot of uh, strangers that contributed to my. But I also. This is another reason that I wanted to stay mostly with virtual rewards because there's not a lot of cost associated with shipping those out to people. And um, I do think I'm going to expand that quite a bit when I do another Kickstarter. Uh, so I'm going to do another one for our some sort of crowdfunding project for Book 2. But, uh, you know, the, the concept of swag was always very interesting to me, and I would definitely would like to get into that more later. But for this first one, I was like, I, I just want to make sure that everything happens. I just want to make sure that I can fulfill everything because I didn't use a, a fulfillment service. I, I shipped everything out myself. And so I was like, even if I if it's too little, if people think, well, you're not offering enough rewards, I wanted to make certain that I'd be able to fulfill everything and I could handle all of the rewards getting shipped out. So which is why, you know, I stayed virtual so that I could, you know, an email is super easy to send with attachments, you know, and it costs very little effort money. And that was the main thing about that. That makes a lot of sense. MT, could you talk about all of the complicated stuff that goes into costing the swag and also international shipping? I mean, that's, that is the killer for me, trying to figure out international shipping and where you charge for it and what you do with it. And oh God. So what's nice is Kickstarter is pretty straightforward. Like you can set up like this is a message to like other people invest for me as I live um, And then I just said like, cause you can tell no, like people can't order internationally. And I said yes, because I do have like readers in Canada and um, I had at least one in England who I knew was going to want all the rewards. Uh, I was like, okay, like I was able to go to the USPS website and put in like, what I think these things are away. And then I figured I would underestimate it and just eat it uh, because I'm okay with that I'm being $5,000. <laughs> um, and when you set shipping costs, um, so for example, my $200 tariff was like $50 to ship internationally. Um, and that $50 goes towards the goal. Um, which I actually kind of appreciate it. as you start to worry about, am I going to reach the goal? But then all those shipping costs are like, yeah. Um, as for budgeting for rewards, I would recommend not choosing four different email pins. <laughs> um, I love them to death. I'm glad I have them. I'm glad it worked out. Maybe not the best idea. They were expensive. They were at least $200 per pin. Um, and I did get like 50 of each, which, you know, is exciting because like I said, I have leftovers. Um, but just like doing that research up front and like being okay with like okay it's gonna cost me almost a fifth of my budget just for the rewards um but again i was trying to get money from people who were already readers and i was like this is what they're gonna like they don't necessarily want an audiobook so it's kind of like a give and take there and then i actually ended up the candles i had to learn how to do myself because i was like i'm gonna do candles and then i did not do another research up front and i was like oh custom candles are expensive <laughs> um and so then i was like I'm gonna get on YouTube and I'm gonna learn how to make candles. Oh, you made your own candles! I did. Oh my I, goodness! I actually had so much fun. Um, I ended up making it several different times and selling those at Comic Con too. Uh, so like, obviously the Flemings Elf is like exclusive to the Kickstarter, but I like I made one that sounds like Froyo because I joke about Froyo, and um, and it was so much cheaper to have a friend over and just have a candle making day, which worried my husband a little bit because he was gone that day and he came in and he's like, it is 80 degrees in here um, and I can't breathe. And we were both sitting there sweating in the kitchen like, we're fine, this is totally okay. <laughs> and then like about 15 minutes later, the head kind of set in and I was like, oh, I am not fine. Um, <laughs> like, if you make your own candles, then I'll leash it. Um, but uh, and working out, um, I don't really have much to add on to the tax stuff, so. Awesome. All right. What I might actually do is flip over to um, a live campaign for a second so we can check out what the campaign pages actually look like. And so if I hide that. This is Tim's Kickstarter right now and it is gorgeous. Um, so Tim, you, you've, you've actually gone the whole, the whole hop with your campaign page. You've got not only the video trailer, but you've got all of these wonderful sections where you're pitching directly to potential backers of why they should back this project, all these beautiful graphics, the character profiles, all of these lovely featured rewards. Um, can you talk us a little bit through like how different or similar have you found pitching a Kickstarter versus how you would normally just pitch a potential reader your books? 
Yeah, it's a, that's a really good question because they're, they're, they're totally different markets I've discovered. So I've never marketed something so hard as this Kickstarter campaign. I haven't seen any of that translate though into book sales or pages read on Kindle Unlimited or anything like that. So it feels like the reader market, I suppose the, for one of the phrase, the ordinary reader market is kind of a different group to the, I suppose, the more hardcore fans that you're trying to reach through, through the Kickstarter market. Um, so yeah, I think it's, it, a lot of this is about making the So they actually come back and refresh this every day just to see what you've posted. And, and so you, you've actually got people coming into this update section and just like checking out what, what's happening and ticking along. Hmm. So did you find that it's more about
age vibrant and um, I suppose current as well. So actually, what what started out that, that story was half the length it, it now is, because one of the things I was did sort of discover quite early on is that a lot of backers and particularly that kind of brigade that hang out in the world of Kickstarter exclusively, they like to see a page that changes and updates, uh, which is something I hadn't fully appreciated until I started. So for me, I really laid into the you know like. I am a enormous fan of Stephen Pacey, and I just named off him as a good. That was one of the main pillars of my marketing strategy. And I was like, I'm a huge fan, and to be able to get, I, I always thought it was going to be this weird pipe dream or something to have my own audiobook narrated by my favorite narrator, this you know incredibly talented theatrical person. But it's no, it's not pipe dream. It's actually right here in front of me, and so you know, if for only like five bucks, ten bucks, you can help be a part of that. And so that was that was definitely the main thing was name dropping him. I remember I made a, a post on Twitter uh, that was uh, I just made a video that was some uh, environmental terrain shot or something like that. But it was a little snippet of uh, Stephen Pacey's voice uh, in one of the lines, and you know it's it's that kind of uh, that teaser, that magical feeling that Tim was talking about. Um, so definitely have a good video. I think that's really important. But also the the page itself should be well presented because. Um, yeah, it, it, it makes sense that people want it to be updated. Uh, that wasn't something that I really did, uh, so no taken. And uh, this sell the story, sell the brand. Be, be genuine about it because that's, that's what's going to hook most people. Not necessarily just the, the the product that you're pitching of the audiobook, but really it's more about this is the story of Tim and this is you know Tim's journey on on the Kickstarter project. And you're all coming with Tim on this journey to get this thing happen. Yeah, I mean it, it does. I think. You know, first of all, I really think people have already said all those things are really, really great advice. And you've got to really know your market and got to know which you tell the story is really the timing of when to tell that story when not to is really, really important. Um, so I spent probably about a month building the things. I knew what I was actually trying to pitch to um, blogs and, um, you know, podcasts and things like that. And then, again, just use my, use my contacts already made through, you know, releasing books, writing over the years to sort of say, would you have the feature in it? Pretty much everyone said yes. So that was, that was really easy. It was a big admin task, like on the Excel spreadsheet list who, who I was talking to when we got to that discussion. But, you know, it got accepted for people, busy, but most people were really happy to have me on. And, you know, on that sometimes builds, like, you know, we had a conversation, not really conversation part because I've been out there talking to other people about it as well. Um, so, yeah, it was, it did take, take organizing a lot of time as well. So I know also think about whether they lie, whether they pre record other things. Because, um, Obviously, at the beginning, it's all pre-recorded to the initial story. Mm. But now, you, you have to listen to my story of 61% funded, bleeding heart to heart. To, uh, we, we can do that, but it's live. So we reacted to what's actually happening. We can make that campaign. Talk about things that change. I can do. We've already done before. So that was more than getting them all stacked up. So we have a month of building. And then the next month, we really filmed the publicity campaign that went alongside it. With, you know, all sorts of things like that interviews and uh, emails, mail shots, you know, that other thing. Get your friends to help you spread the word. Because it's very boring. It's just me all the time. Mm. So other people are sharing your story. That, again, it, it is very, very powerful, actually. So, you know, I've been featured on lots of people mailing lists and, you know, there, you know, some people have, you know, perhaps you've noticed for some people when I was struggling to get to create and fresh marketing material and videos and graphics, you know, somebody actually sent me some, which I didn't ask for, but they, they just appeared as if I, as if I, as if I knew it was, but it appears if I imagine. And so, yeah, people get behind that thing and then they start to support you in their own way as well, which is amazing. That is and absolutely it, amazing. It's just, um, it's planned. Now, now it's more chaos reacting and just kind of different ideas and things at this stage, really. That's so fascinating to me, uh, the fact that you've got to really be agile and to respond to all the things that are happening on the fly. Uh, oh my goodness, that, that's just so inspiring that you had all these people pitch in, especially with like the graphics just magically showing up. Yeah, that is amazing. fantastic and a really great case in point of what the indie community is capable of, I think. Uh, let's move on and talk a little bit about logistics and fulfillment because the digital stuff is easy, the physical stuff is what is absolutely doing my head in. And um, we might go to Steve first and then go to MT for this one. So Steve, when you did your paperback book, how did you handle that? Did, did you do them sort of as a print on demand, like a big box of author copies? How did you do all the shipping? Because you, you did um, domestic shipping only within the US, is that right? Yes, and uh, I regret that. <laughs> um, I wish that I, uh, I, I wish I would have included other countries, but I, I just didn't think it through. And the, you know, I talk about the big name that Stephen Pacey is. He's an even bigger name across the pond in the UK. So like, if I would have included at least them in the shipping, then I, I probably could have done a little bit better. So I, I. And I, it's just, I, I should have bit the bullet and paid more for the shipping in order to offer more to more people because uh, I know that that is um, a thing that some people say is that like, well, I, you know, swag is great and virtual things are great, but I really do want the physical book at the end of the day. And another thing I learned in my survey at the end was that a lot of people would have liked a hardback to have been offered. And, you know, I mentioned earlier that I was, I was just going to stay away from that to make sure I could do everything else, but... You know, people really want it, and so as far as a reward tier goes, it probably would have served me well to include that and to include other countries in the in the shipping. Uh, I did it because it was the cheaper option, 
And, and I thought to myself, most of my rewards are virtual, so I can still give the majority of rewards to anyone, anywhere. Uh, I just will only ship to the United States. But for those that I did ship out, I just handled it myself. Yeah, I just I, I got all the books, author copies, and had them here in my home, and then I went and shipped them out uh, myself. And, you know, luckily, uh, UPS offers a special rate to uh, the small businesses shipping out for business purposes, and so it wasn't you know, terribly expensive. Uh, but that was just part of the cost that I uh, built into the overall uh, pledge goal that I was trying to reach. Um, so and I priced it right at the the cost of of paying for everything and shipping things out. And so that yeah, I uh, the amount of money that I got it was to pay for everything to a T, and shipping was already built into the original pledge amount. That makes a lot of sense. I'm super jealous, by the way, of the fact that the US has Neo Mail. Australia does not have anything like that. So every single time I send a book, I send it as a package. And the last time I shipped something to Canada, I think it was, it cost me like fifteen dollars to ship it via Australia Post, which is just absolutely because I'm really curious as to how Mary handles international shipping. Because I'm just like getting anything to and from Australia, it just sucks. Yeah. Uh, no, so I'm only just starting the fulfillment stage. Um, like I said, I've got like my little pins in. Uh, and luckily, there's not a ton of international uh, packages I will be sending. There's a couple to Canada and like this thing huge because uh, even like my, my 60 not my 60 my 50 dollars here like just for like reference it's a card three pins and this and like they already got the audiobook um and like, that's not that's like, easy to ship um i'm not super worried about the like small handful of canadians that i have to fill to i do have one in england that i know is going to be a wallet buster but um that's okay because again they did you know pay for most of the shipping um and then uh, i yeah i think it'll be pretty straightforward <laughs> um like I said, why it's not super huge. And then I do have, at one point years, I actually had like a special hard, hardback edition that's annotated. Mm -hmm. And so that one is not going to ship with these because it's taking a little longer. And there's like, you know, seven whole people waiting for it. So, and most of them know me. So none <laughs> of them are sitting there going, where's my book, Mary? Um, and all but one of them are US. So that'll be media mail. Um, um, so yeah, I, I'm not too worried about it. I think it'll work out. That definitely helps you to know that when, when you're in fulfillment stage. Tim, with your 14 tiers, how are you managing? Fulfillment. Are you going to using some sort of like back of kit pledge manager thing? Are you going to be doing like more offset print review books? Or are you just going to be drop Like how? How is all that going to work? It's all about me. Um, again, I'm just paying to help fill the atmosphere. So and also around the finances, but it's the atmosphere as well. I knew what it would cost from doing that. So it was just taking a bit of view. What is it like to just send you know that around the world as my sort of base shipping? I, I was you know basically worked out what it would be for UK. It's obviously cheaper because that's where I live. But pretty much for everywhere else, it's our Europe ten pounds, or the rest of the world is kind of fifteen. And that, that sort of was how the anatomy fear experience worked out. So that wouldn't work on a stack of or like a sunset. But I've got to review that I'll take a small on shipping some of those things on the basis of keeping it simple but the people also not up in the shipping to become relatively expensive really. But most of it is, is digital part of you're filling it. It's asking organized as well as the other thing, have a spreadsheet is like strong advice for this. Work out who you're filling, who, what 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 they're entitled to. Um, you know, remember what it is mean because that's that's that can get you a lot of sense you're setting up. But like I say, if you want to it down the down the line, it's like, oh gosh, what what person time to so it's not it's just you know it is the in admin. And if you admin right, the film become very straightforward. And you can do a lot of that actually through um, kickstart messages directly. So you can email people through Kickstarter, for example. So fulfilling the audible that's really hard use and then you just get part, you know, find some packaging materials and take and getting stuff sent off around the world really. So I think I'm not too worried about it. I'm before. You're giving me a lot more confidence now because the, the logistics is a main weakness, I would say. I, I, I cannot work with all the different combinations. So hearing say that is very, very reassuring. So I am conscious that we are approaching the two hour mark. So let's move on to just a general kind of high level wrap up. What, if anything, would you do differently about this entire process? Uh, anything from getting the audiobook uh, produced through to how you run Kickstarter. If you're going to run another campaign for another audiobook, what would you do differently? And we might start with Mary. Oh, I would not. I would not run Kickstarter during the holidays. <laughs> um, that was so dumb. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that wraps up. I would probably not do four enable pins. Um, I love them. I'm so glad I have them. But that was a risk. Mm -hmm. that out. Steve. I I do plan to uh, run another starter for mm -hmm. my second book in the War Drag Saga, and I am going to probably offer a hardcover as one of the rewards, just because that was something that people said they would have liked. And I will probably look at offering some sort of art reward. Uh, maybe not um, physical set, like, like something like that, but maybe just artwork that could be uh, sent virtually to someone, something like that. People, I found that people really like artwork. You know, they, they really like to see the characters drawn out and, and actually visible to them. Um, and I will include shipping to, uh, to other countries besides the U.S., for sure. <laughs> Tim, what about you? Are you still in the middle of your campaign and your process? But based on your experience, what would you do differently? Um, yeah, it's, it's a hindsight of a really good thing. In a couple of weeks, I'll look back on this one, but, you know, whether I did it or not, really. So, I think one thing I have learned 
that doesn't work. And you know, probably for reasons we talked about earlier on on this uh, on this podcast, is I did do some experimentation paid advertising to the beginning of the campaign and also at the end. Mm-hmm. The, using out um, Facebook's automated um, dashboard just fired it out for awareness. And it did get much more targeted at the end. Mm-hmm. And it actually killed that second advert uh, because it wasn't working. People were clicking on it. But no one was tra- nothing. Nothing was translating through to people mm-hmm. actually backing, and I think that's down to that. But you said something about logic versus the you know um, sort of emotional connection of why back a particular product. Mm-hmm. So what I was doing was raising awareness. But it wasn't enough of an emotional pull people to then mm-hmm. commit to backing a project for somebody they never they never heard of before. I guess so. Uh, for me, I don't get bothered with paid adverts again. I think it's more about telling the story and focusing on on that. I think is the key. That's fascinating. That's awesome. All right. We do have a few questions that I've up in the little uh, poll tool thing. I think we've covered most of these, but the one part um, I think that segues neatly into our final thoughts and wrap up is this question about what do you think, now what you throw out, what do you think goes into giving your Kickstarter the best chance at success? Um, and maybe let's start with Steve this time. The factor who I think is most important for making my Kickstarter successful. Yeah. Right? Yeah, what goes into giving your kids other its best hands at success? Is, is it telling the story? Is it your ability to pull in new backers? Is it some other magical factor that we haven't touched on? It, it, well, this question really kind of flies in the face of what I think is like all of us are just kind of uh, <laughs> uh, throwing this out there, hoping and praying. And, and, uh, but I, I'll say that, um, yeah, what I said earlier about uh, creating this story that, about you and your journey in being an indie author, because we're all on this on our own. You know, we don't have major publishing houses behind us. We don't have marketing agency helping out. And uh, a lot of what we're doing, we're figuring out on the go. And, you know, and, and it's tough. And um, so, and that, that you know, that's why all, we're all here right now. So we're sharing our experiences for other people who are just going to then go do it and find out their own stuff as they go. And so it, it really is about letting people into the journey of you following your dreams because that's I, you know I, I have to believe that's why we're all indie authors because we love doing what we're doing and writing telling these stories it's not for the money you know? and uh so yeah like let people in and convert people into believers about the concept of following your dreams because we're here we're living it we're using we're crowdfunding to be able to live it and it's tough but it's also in the long run it's worth it that's fantastic tim what are your thoughts what are your final um, words of advice to anybody thinking about embarking on a Kickstarter campaign. Yeah, well, Steve's nailed that a bit. So, but I think, yeah, <laughs> it, it is about the story. It is about the emotional connection, ultimately, um, being prepared. And I think um, I will go back into looking successful. If you're looking for you know, reacting and fresh ideas, I, I mentioned support network a bit earlier on on this call. I think that's really, really important as well. Um, so I think all the ideas coming from you, that's quite a challenge. So, you know, surround yourself with creative people that want you to succeed because that, that goes a long way to actually helping you with ideas to help you go over the line as well. Um, and yeah, I think... I will just maybe I think you need to be prepared for outcomes as well. You know, mm-hmm. writing is always by its definition it's a risky endeavor, isn't it? We, we definitely don't do it for the money, we do it because we want to create new art and, and do and do creative things. Some things will work and some things won't work. You, you need, I suppose, to be to go into mindset being prepared to be able to manage. So mm-hmm. both outcomes, you know, it's the same as release a book, getting a good review or a bad review, it's the same book reactions, it's exactly the same concept as that crowdfunding. Your campaign different reactions to different people, it's the same campaign. It's about finding the ones you really want to connect with. Absolutely. Mary, what are your thoughts? What are your final words that I yeah, um, definitely. Sorry, my husband just started calling me. <laughs> uh, be kind to yourself uh, because when you're in the thick of it, when you're not getting that funding that you thought you'd be getting, it's really easy to get like in your feelings and feeling inadequate and feeling embarrassed because mm-hmm. uh, it's a very public thing that you're doing and everyone can see how much money you're making and how many people are supporting you. And it, it can be very uh, hard to deal with feelings of shame when you want to look successful. Mm-hmm. Oh, gosh. Am I still? Yeah, you're still here. We okay. still got you. Sorry. Oh, <laughs> my whole screen just. Hold on. Uh, I just had my husband. That's all right. Welcome oh. back. <laughs> okay, I just want him. Um, he is instant. Okay. Uh, so, sorry. Uh, just be kind to yourself. I think you guys wrapped it up nicely. Excellent. Uh, thank you so much. All right. We might close here because we're almost up on the two hours. So a big, big, big thank you to Tim, to Mary, to Steve for doing this live Q&A. And here is one final chance to pitch anybody who is watching on your books. And we might start with you, Steve. Where can people find your books and who should read them? Uh, this little uh, little is called Amazon and Audible. You can find Web Renegades. Uh, and I would say if you are uh, like the, the the exact person is a nerdy military veteran, 